Hi, thanks to everybody else for joining. As Linda said, my name is Autumn Cool, and I am the Cultural Resources Field Lead at Bat Conservation International. As you should know, we are a nonprofit organization dedicated to ending bat extinctions worldwide. So I joined BCI a little over two years ago. Before that, I started with an undergrad at Lewis and Clark College in Portland, my master's at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville, and then I spent about seven years working in various archaeology positions across Colorado. So yeah, I'm an archaeologist, but I work in wildlife conservation. How did that happen? And what does archaeology matter to bats? So I'm going to start today off with a quick introduction to archaeology, and then I'm going to go into how I joined BCI and what my team has been up to. And finally, I'll dive into ways that adding a cultural resources component to wildlife conservation can benefit everyone. To start off, I know it's really common for most folks to picture something like this when they think about archaeology. These might be entertaining, but they are really terrible representations of real world archaeology. I also have to acknowledge that it's a very, very common misconception that archaeologists dig up dinosaurs. We do not. We leave the dinosaurs for the paleontologists to handle. Archaeology is a subfield of anthropology, the study of humans. And archaeology specifically is the study of material objects made or modified by humans and which are at least 50 years old. So most archaeology, as it's conducted in the U.S. today, starts off with a fieldwork session that looks something like this. A group of archaeologists will walk grid patterns over the landscape to search for artifacts or features lying on the ground surface. This is also called a cultural resource inventory. When we find something, we'll pause and take photos, notes, and coordinates. We conduct field work in all weather and in all environments, and it is not nearly as glamorous as Indiana Jones makes it out to be. Sometimes we do work on large excavation projects in order to conduct extensive research at a specific site or to salvage materials that would be destroyed if they were left in place. But many of you might be surprised to learn that a lot of archaeologists really only spend a very small portion of their time working on excavations because most of the time we try to leave things safely buried in the ground. Before and after field work, like with every job, there's a lot of research, analysis, and report writing But we try to figure out what the things we found during field work tell us about the past. In fact, for just about every day we spent in the field, we spent three or four days in the office. And of course, there are a lot of different types of archaeology, different subspecialties within the field. But I'd say that this is still a pretty typical work distribution for the majority of professional archaeologists in the U.S. Okay, so that is sort of a quick intro to how we do archaeology, but why do archaeology and what does it have to do with bats? So, well, for the why, most archaeologists enter the field because we are genuinely fascinated by the past and we really want to understand and preserve the stories of those who came before us, especially the untold stories. Written historical texts were usually created or funded by only the most powerful figures, successful military leaders, church leaders, politicians, aristocrats. So if we only relied on the stories that they wrote and that they preserved, we would have a really biased view of the past. Very few average Joes left written records of their lives that were preserved to be studied today. But by studying the marks that people made on the landscape and the material objects that they left behind, we can gain a more nuanced understanding of the past and how we got to where we are today. While some universities and some private research institutions do study archaeology purely for the sake of expanding our body of knowledge, most archaeologists, like myself, work outside of academia. 
There are hundreds, if not thousands, of private cultural resource management firms across the country that primarily conduct archaeological inventories in order to help other industries or other, other organizations meet the requirements to complete their projects. This is commonly referred to as cultural compliance work. In the U.S., the primary regulations for the management of cultural materials are laid out in the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, and the National Historic Preservation Act. Essentially, these regulations stipulate that any work being conducted on federal land or with federal funds or permits needs a cultural review to make sure that the work doesn't damage important cultural resources. Projects subject to these rules range widely and include everything from freeway expansions to cell tower construction to environmental restoration work being done on public lands. And these regulations are essential. They are in place to prevent things like a gas pipeline being driven right through an old cemetery, which is a thing that has happened more than once. So, Within BCI, we've got a handful of primary branches, like such as scientific research and public outreach. I only included a couple branches here just to keep this chart really simple. I work in our Habitat Protection and Restoration Program, or HPNR, which is one of our conservation programs. Since I joined BCI to establish the cultural team about two years ago, most of my work has been conducted in tandem with our subterranean team, which studies and protects underground bat habitat. Specifically, most of my recent work has been on abandoned mine land or AML projects. Many state and federal agencies are currently working to close abandoned mines to protect humans and wildlife that could be in danger if they were to go underground. However, abandoned mines can also be really great bat habitat, so we want to be conscientious about how the mines are closed so that the bats aren't cut off from this important space. And that's where BCI comes in. We partner with those agencies, like the Department of Energy and the Bureau of Land Management, to make sure that mine closure methods are appropriate to the type of habitat that each mine contains. Our subterranean team specialists enter the abandoned mines to look for signs of bat use and assess the quality of the potential habitat within each mine. And then they let the agencies know which mines can be safely walled off or buried and which ones are actually worth spending a little extra time and money installing bat gates on. Now, because these closure projects are funded by federal agencies or occur on public lands, a cultural resources inventory has always been required under the regulations I mentioned earlier. Before I joined BCI, that part of the project used to be handled separately by private companies or sometimes even the land management agency themselves. However, by keeping those two types of survey, the biological and the cultural separate, it was hard for each organization to understand why the other was making the recommendations that they did. They often didn't even know what the other's recommendations were until it was time to get out there and close the mines, which made negotiating changes almost impossible. But by creating our own cultural resources department within BCI, we've streamlined the process and we've opened up lines of communication between the biologists and the archeologists that weren't there before. Now we can collaborate and share our needs or concerns early to keep all these projects moving along at a steady pace. So I'm gonna dig in now into a little bit more detail about how these cultural resource inventories work. So first we look for any archeological sites that might be affected by the proposed project. Most of the abandoned mines themselves that we're conducting closures on are archaeological sites based on the definition here. And in addition, I have found evidence of prehistoric occupation near some of the mines that we've worked at. I found projectile points at the edges of mine sites. And once I found a historic old mining road that had been cut right through the center of the remains of a Puebloan room block structure and a midden pile. So in the field, my cultural resources team is recording what physically remains of these historic period mines 
as well as any other cultural resources that we find in the vicinity. Then we conduct extensive research about the history and context of these archeological sites to determine which ones are culturally significant. A significant site is one that is considered eligible for listing on the National Register of Historic Places or NRHP. How do we make those determinations of significance? An NRHP eligible or significant site must meet at least one of these four criteria. Criterion A is asks, if the site was the location of an important event or cultural trend, or did it make a notable contribution to an important event? For example, we've been doing a lot of work on World War II era uranium mines. Obviously, World War II is a major historical event, but we can't say that every single tiny uranium mine that operated during the war is eligible. However, an extensive mine that contributed a large amount of radioactive material directly to the Manhattan Project would definitely meet Criterion A. Criterion B asks if the site is directly associated with an important person. And again, by directly associated, we don't just mean, did Marie Curie visit here once upon a time? But is this the mine where she came to collect radioactive samples used in her groundbreaking research? Criterion C asks if the site is a very well-preserved example of a distinctive or unique design. Is it a distinctive Fremont rock art site in great shape? Or is it a mine that contains an interesting technological innovation? And finally, Criterion D asks, if we are to continue studying this site in depth, would we be able to learn important new things about the past? Criterion D often applies best to prehistoric sites where artifacts and features might be buried and an excavation could uncover a lot of new information about prehistoric life waste but maybe a mine with extensive unexplored subterranean workings could also be considered eligible under D. In addition to the four eligibility criteria, an archeological site must also retain most of these seven aspects of integrity to be considered eligible for the NRHP and worthy of preservation. Integrity can be a little subjective to assess, but generally we try to think about how the site has been altered in the time since it was actively in use or created. For example, has the site been damaged? Has it been looted? Have portions of the site been reconstructed or redesigned with new materials? Has the landscape around it been drastically altered and turned into a strip mall? Or is it well preserved? And finally, can you tell what type of a site it is by looking at it? The site in this photo clearly doesn't have very good integrity. So if a site is determined to be significant or eligible for a listing on the National Register of Historic Places, that means that legally this site must be protected and preserved. In our AML projects, that means that we have to take extra precautions during our mine closures. The precautions can vary quite a bit depending on the nature and the location of the specific site. If the significant site is a prehistoric resource located next to the mine, the precautions might just require that an archaeologist is present when the closures are installed to keep an eye on things, or they may ban vehicles and heavy machinery from driving through certain areas. If the mine itself is significant, they may require modifications to the way the closures are installed, or they might even ban certain types of closures altogether to preserve the physical integrity of the site. It really depends on what specifically the mine or the site is significant for. If the closures will cause irreparable damage, or is the mine in good enough shape that it can afford a little bit of meddling? So I've talked a lot about the AML projects that my cultural resources team has been assisting our subterranean team with, but BCI also has a restoration team that we will be helping with on future projects, but I have to hire a couple more people first so that we have that capacity. But two major categories of projects that our restoration team work on include agave planting and water protection. So all across the American Southwest, nectar feeding bats rely on blooming agave for food. 
Habitat loss due to development and climate change is seriously threatening these important resources. So BCI is attempting to counteract that by planting new baby agave everywhere that we can. Similarly, important water resources for bats like desert springs are threatened by development, erosion, and destructive invasive species like burrows. So we have another restoration team that works on building erosion control structures like the check dams you see in this photo and installing fences to protect the most sensitive areas from further damage. And because these projects involve moving earth and rock around, we wanna be cautious that we aren't inadvertently digging in a graveyard or collecting rocks for our check dams from an old collapsed prehistoric structure. So for these projects, a cultural resources inventory should be conducted first to identify where archeological sites are located, which ones are significant and thus need to be protected. And then we let our restoration teams know which areas are safe to work in and which areas should be avoided so that we don't irreparably damage cultural resources. So why is this important? Why does it matter to bats? I know I'm talking a lot about the rules and the regulations regarding when and how to conduct cultural resource inventories, but I really don't think about my job in terms of just ticking a bunch of boxes on some bureaucratic checklist. Cultural resources work should absolutely be done alongside and in partnership with all environmental conservation work for several reasons. Okay, one, while I'd like to think that most people value cultural heritage and environmental conservation equally, we all know that is simply not true. Everyone brings a different set of values to the table. To gain new partners, to reinvigorate the interests of old partners, and to increase our base of support, we need to address how our work touches other areas of need. Yeah, with some audiences, all that we need to say is, this stream restoration project will provide clean drinking water for 5,000 bats and we get support. But there are also plenty of people out there who would hear that and respond with, okay, that sounds neat, but I've got my own problems to worry about right now. And I understand that we all have a very limited amount of emotional energy and financial support that we can afford to invest in all the different worthy causes in the world. But when we use a broader perspective to promote our work, we can get people a little more interested and a little more enthusiastic. We already understand that it's going to be more effective to say, this stream restoration project will provide clean drinking water for 5,000 bats. Those 5,000 bats will eat half their body weight in insects each night. Fewer insects reduces the spread of disease. Plus, it allows local farmers to decrease their reliance on pesticides. That saves them time and money, and it makes your food a little bit cleaner and a little bit more affordable. Those 5,000 bats will also pollinate crops and wild plants. Do you ever drink tequila? The agave we make tequila from is almost exclusively pollinated by bats. So protecting bats protects your ability to kick back on a Friday night on your front porch with an organic salad, a margarita, all while not being eaten alive by mosquitoes. So when we can identify the motivating factors of different groups, we can then look for those areas of overlap in our interests and opportunities for new partnerships. Likewise, the cultural resources component can also help broaden that base of support by conducting archeological research about the places that we're interested in protecting or restoring to benefit bats, we can identify what other potential stakeholders might exist in the region. Some people honestly don't care very much about bats or environmental conservation at all, but they're thrilled to meet someone interested in learning about their family history. I've met people in economically depressed former mining boom towns who still have a lot of pride and passion around the work that their parents, their grandparents did in the mines. And they're glad that a professional researcher will spread that story to a wider audience. That gives them a reason to support our work in the area. Indigenous groups might be interested in helping to preserve and protect a spring or a forest or a specific landform, not because of the bats that live there and need it, 
but because the location is a traditional cultural property that is valued as a sacred space. In fact, among the Coast Salish, some natural landforms are not just seen as sacred places, but those landforms are literally understood to be the direct ancestors of modern First Nations people. So of course they're gonna to wanna to preserve and protect those features. We have to be aware of these cultural elements if we want to be successful in our conservation work in those areas. And embracing the stories of those who came before us enables us to make more informed and conscientious decisions about how we conduct our work in a way that benefits not just the bats, but the people that share this space with them. Conducting cultural resources work in tandem with ecological conservation can also actively inform and guide our current decisions. For example, out of control wildfires are a huge threat to bats and every other species that lives or feeds in forested landscapes. Wildfires are increasing not just due to climate change, but because the United States has been actively working to suppress and prevent all fires since the Forest Service created the 10 a.m. rule in 1935. This means that species that need a more open canopy or a more open forest floor are being edged out. That reduces biodiversity and food sources. Plus, our forests are filling up with dense deadfall. The left photo here I took on a survey just a couple minutes away from downtown Steamboat Springs, Colorado. The entire forest is a tinderbox waiting to go up. The right photo is a post-fire image I took a few miles north of Rocky Mountain National Park. So because our 20th century fire suppression model hasn't really been working as well as we wanted, land managers and conservation organizations are currently to turning toward traditional indigenous methods of fire control. Native Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Alaskan Natives all traditionally employed controlled burns to manage their lands. Small fires were set to clear underbrush, encourage the spread of species that rely on intense heat to propagate, and reduce competition around food bearing or medicinal plants. They also know that controlled burns would use up fuels before they could accumulate to the stage you see in my photo, which drastically reduces the chance of catastrophic wildfires. These traditional methods are being reintroduced into modern fire control activities because we have thousands of years of oral tradition supported by archeological evidence that these methods work. Archaeological research has also shown that people in Mesoamerica were cultivating agave as much as 6,000 years ago. Agave cultivation then spread to the Chihuahuan Desert of northern Mexico and the southwest by at least 2,000 years ago. By studying how these first farmers were so successful without any modern technology, we can learn to be more effective in our own agave restoration projects. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. The original inhabitants of this land already spent thousands of years learning which species are successful in which different environmental niches and how much human interference they actually need to, to be successful. For example, we learned to use rock mulch, which is a very economical and efficient way to trap soil and moisture around baby agave by studying hohokam sites, like the one shown in this black and white photo. And finally, incorporating cultural resources work into modern conservation efforts moves us towards a future of conservation that is in line with our values and that respects and treasures the diversity of humanity as much as we cherish the diversity of nature. Conservation has a very colonial history. Native Americans were coerced or forcibly relocated from their ancestral lands to establish several of our national parks, including Yosemite and Glacier. And this wasn't just in the past. In East Africa, the Maasai have recently been violently pushed out of their traditional grazing lands to make room for game reserves. All of these actions are rooted in this colonial misconception that true nature is pristine and untouched by human hands and that the best way to protect it is to keep the two separated. 
but archaeology and other cultural resources work, such as ethnography and history, have demonstrated time and time again that this is untrue, that there are almost no places on Earth where the landscape has not been altered by persistent human intervention. What we tend to think of as nature is really more of an overgrown garden than some isolated wilderness. So with cultural resources work, we can help correct some of these misconceptions by providing hard physical data that supports or supplements the stories that minority or oppressed groups have been trying to tell us about their histories. We can identify which groups traditionally occupied an area and how they lived within the landscape as an active part of it, not just as visitors passing across it. And then when we are making decisions about where and how to pursue our conservation goals, we can go beyond the bare minimum of federal regulations. We can identify those people who have ties to the area where we want to work and invite them to be true partners in our efforts. And by celebrating this holistic version of ecology that sees humans as a part of the environment, we can find a more sustainable method of conservation, one that doesn't force conservationists to choose between protecting endangered animal and plant species and protecting humans. Instead, we can find a way to do both. And I think this is not just our moral and ethical duty in an increasingly post-colonial world, but I also think it will genuinely make our conservation work more successful by forging new allies and new paths forward. Thank you. All right, well, thank you so much, Autumn. Uh, that is really fascinating stuff. Um, so we've got some time now for questions. Um, so make sure you've shared um, questions that you have in the Q&A box. Uh, we don't have any quite yet. So Autumn, I wanna ask you a question myself. What are some of the neatest things you've found at, on a BCI project? Oh, on a BCI project, this summer I found what I thought was an old round tobacco tin, picked it up, brushed it off to try to read the label on it, shook it to see if it was anything in it. Something was rattling. Something fell out of a little hole in the side. I look at, pick it up and realize, oh, this is a blasting cap. I am holding a 50 plus year old explosive device in my hand and I just shook it around. So uh, that was very exciting and a little bit nerve wracking. And we called the BLM and they came in and got rid of it for us. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, well, we've got a question from Megan. Um, what has been the most challenging aspect of the mine work? Mm, good question. I think, uh, Megan, academically speaking, I feel that the most challenging aspect of the mine work is that I really want to go inside every single mine, which I I don't have the safety training. I can't do it unless I'm with those subterranean specialists. So I usually have to wait for them to come back and share their maps. And I feel like it's hard to make an, a full assessment of a mine without going in there myself, but it's not, it's not worth the risk. And then out the other challenging part of the work is just finding the time and the people to keep up with it because there are just thousands and thousands of abandoned mines that we're trying to help close and there's never enough time of the day to get them all down. Hmm. Okay, well, we've got a question um, from Allison, and she would love to hear about your favorite location or community that you've encountered. I think maybe my favorite place that I worked was my very first archaeology project, which is uh, my field school. All archaeologists go to a field school, which is sort of like a, a boot camp training. Mine was in British Columbia. We were partnering with the Chihuahua tribe, which are, is a member of the Coast Salish uh, Indian group. And so we actually had tribal elders at the site with us, helping to interpret our finds as we went. It just felt like such a collaborative and welcoming community. And I'm originally from the Pacific Northwest, so I like hanging out in the soggy woods and learning more about the place where I grew up. 
Oh, cool. Um, so Sylvia is asking, um, um, how can the general public help? I think the big thing is to just speak up for the people and the places that you care about. I, I like obviously, if you can contribute financially to nonprofit organizations like BCI or like Earth Justice that are out there trying to protect the environment, that's wonderful. But even just sharing and spreading information and is huge because you know it's hard for anyone no it's difficult to change a stranger's mind about what's important and what is valued but it's easy to change your friends and family minds so you know just just talking about these things that you care about with people that you care about is the best way to make a difference oh. all right um and so uh another question here diane is asking um how do you close a mine what does that mean? Yeah, well, Diane, a lot of the mines we're working at literally have open holes in the ground, whether it's a vertical mine shaft or a horizontal tunnel that we'll call an adit. We can do anything from building a rock wall across it, putting a big iron gate or grate over it. Uh, sometimes we use a uh, polyurethane foam, which is an expanding foam that is similar to the stuff that you've seen in household insulation to fill in those gaps. There's a lot of different options out there. Oh, okay, uh, here's a fun one from Gary. Uh, any theory, any personal theories on why so many of the quote unquote footprints on petroglyphs have six quote unquote toes? That is not an area of my specialty. Sorry, I have no idea there. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Do bats have six toes? Maybe that's what it is. I <laughs> <laughs> love bats. Um, okay, and um, we've got a question. Um, how many of our mine surveys result in saving bat habitats? I think all of our mine surveys result in saving some bad habitat. Uh, every project I've been on for the last two years, we're finding some evidence of bat use and sometimes a few live bats. And, you know, every little every little mine that you can identify and protect that way is habitat that is being protected. Great. Well, a question from Lydia. Um, she does give us a caveat that she joined a few minutes late so maybe she missed it but um since everything um is kind of done in-house but with the regulations that you mentioned um has there ever been a lot of pushback against your recommendation or recommendations or actions from outside or governmental organizations um so the recommendations that we make at the very end before they're implemented have to be approved by the lead land management agency whether it's a national forest we're working in or bureau of land management as well as the state historic preservation office so we've had um we've had some issues where you know we wanted to you know, I, I thought maybe this mine wasn't very historically important, so let's go ahead and just backfill it. They said, actually, we have some other information that you missed, and we don't want to backfill it. You know, there's there's always a little bit of pushback. It's a long process of conversation between all of the different organizations. Okay. Um, so Martha is asking, um, it seems like you've mentioned a lot of work that appears to be in um, the South, Southwest maybe. Um, are you doing work in Mid-America or the Eastern US? Right now, the work that we're doing is primarily, and the cultural work has been primarily in the Four Corners region, like in Western Colorado and Eastern Utah. This is where uranium mines are located on the Colorado Plateau. They're only found, primarily only found in that part of the US. Uh, and so that's where we've been focused very recently because having radioactive mines open and accessible is adds an extra layer of danger upon above and beyond just accidentally falling in a hole. Uh, so that's where we've been focused. Uh, we don't have any work on the East Coast yet. I know coal mines are a big problem out there, but I don't think that uh, Bat Conservation International has dipped our toes into that yet. 
but we are growing fast and maybe we'll get out there. All right. Um, let's see. How are, this is kind of based on a question Vivian's um, putting forward. Um, how kind of often are abandoned mines colonized by bats? Like, is this very common that they're all in there? And is this more common in some uh, regions of the US than others? Ooh, again, I'm the archeologist, I'm not <laughs> the bat biologist, so I might not be the best person to ask, but I know that what the bats are typically looking for is a true dark zone. So not just a shallow mine or a mine that's collapsing in the roof so that light is coming through. It needs to be a nice true dark zone. It needs to be nice and cold um, and hopefully near a source of water somewhere. Uh, and the rock featuring the type of rock that forms the ceiling or what we call the back of the mine has to be a nice good grippy texture for them to hang on to. Um, I can't tell you like how many are colonized by bats, but I know my subterranean team colleagues could go into that in more depth. You know, it, it just does seem very common. I'd say more, more are colonized by bats than are not. And that's about as far as I'm willing to commit. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Um, let's see. Now, uh, you've already stated petroglyphs are not your, uh, your specialty. But <laughs> Megan wants to know, do you know of any bat-related petroglyphs? Any famous ones? Off the top of my head, I'm, I'm sure they're out there. Bats are culturally very interesting because they're an animal that lives in the liminal space between the earth, under the earth, and the sky. They're active at dawn and dusk in that time between true day and true night. And that's a really interesting aspect that, at least in North America, a lot of indigenous cultures see animals that cross those major boundaries as holding a really special role in the spiritual realm. Off the top of my head, I'm not familiar with any bat-related rock art. Uh, I do know some Mimbra's pottery from the Southwest features bat patterns, and it's definitely something that I've been thinking I need to do a lot more research on it. Well, we'll look forward to it then. Um, so we got a question from Harrison. Um, can you tell us more about that site with an old mining road running through the prehistoric settlement? Yeah, so this had, this is in Utah in the Manti LaSalle National Forest. There's an old Pueblo and room block structure, very overgrown. Uh, what it looks like on the surface is just maybe a faintly rectangular pattern of like building foundations, just some, some round cobbles making little rectangles on the ground. Really hard to spot unless you've had a lot of practice at it. And then around probably the 1920s, 1930s, some miners came in to look for uranium in that area. And they put a few holes into the hillside near the Pueblo. And then they built, they drove a road right through the Pueblo and right through the midden, which is the trash pile next to the Pueblo to up to another part of the site where they built some cabins and stuff. And this road just like cut right through this landform. And you could see on the, the cut bank on the edges of the road, old pottery spilling out from the, the midden, the old trash heap. And you could see where there used to be a perfect rectangle of a stone foundation, but part of it had been wiped out by the road. Uh, I'm sure some of the miners spotted the pottery eventually and maybe collected some of it, but I, they clearly didn't know that anything was there when they just drove that road right through the middle. And if we're lucky, all they did was cut through it with the road and they didn't completely bulldoze and obliterate the entire thing. So that site, that prehistoric component of that site is now listed and protected. The Forest Service now knows it's there. They've got coordinates for it and they're careful to avoid it in any future work. So when we went back out there to close up that mine that sort of overlaps the site, we made sure that those contractors you know, approach the site from the opposite side away from that Pueblo so that we weren't driving through it again and again. Oh, wow. Was there uh, any uh, really cool artifacts you found while, uh, while doing that? 
I think I actually showed that slide earlier. The collection of pottery was from that specific site. My computer's being a little bit slow here. So this is a collection of pottery from that site. And it was exciting because there's quite a different variety of different patterns and textures that we found in that area. Oh, all right. Um, so it sounds like you primarily focus on the uh, human related things. Are there arche archaeologists that collect um, skeletal remains of bats or fossilized bats and um, inform kind of the history of bats in that way? That would be something that paleontologists would focus on. Uh, archaeologists really focus just on humans, although there are um, biological anthropologists or bioarchs that might focus on like early hominids and maybe some some that focus on the interplay of people with animals and plants around them. But if someone's focusing just on ancient bats or fossilized or skeletalized bats, that would be a paleontologist. All right, that makes sense. Um, I see a question from Elaine. Um, do you use ground penetrating radar to find things? Uh, I have not used it at BCI yet, but I have used ground penetrating radar and magnetometry and thermal imaging to look for buried archaeological features in the past. Yes. Ew. Well, another question from Harrison, uh, what happens to collected artifacts? Well, first of all, we try not to collect artifacts because there is a curation crisis in the US right now, which means we have spent so many decades, centuries, just gathering stuff that our museum basements are overflowing with artifacts. So we really try not to collect anything unless we know for sure it's going to be destroyed if we leave it in the field. Archaeology today in the U.S. is catch and release. Um, if we do collect an artifact, there are certified repositories in every state. Uh, any archaeological firm that conducts work in that state needs to have a contract with at least one of those repositories, and they will store and curate those artifacts for us. But again, I try not to collect anything at all. And I highly recommend if you encounter something that looks like an old artifact in the field, whether it's a really sweet arrowhead or a cool old purple glass bottle, the best most responsible thing to do about that is to try to leave it where it is. Uh, by removing it from its context, the situation in which it's found, we don't know like how it relates to the people that were there anymore. We don't know how it relates to other things in the area. It loses that context and it basically erases its history if you just pick it up and put it in your pocket. So we always try to leave things where we found them as much as possible. Good to know. Okay. Um, and a question um, from Connor. Um, when you do go down into the mines, um, do you get up close and personal with um, the bats? And if you do, have you encountered any evidence of white nose syndrome amongst the bat colonies in those mines? Again, I, I've been very lucky that I did get to go with our subterranean team on a couple of their surveys. Again, they have the fancy safety training. I do not. So they only let me go in the easy mines for babies. No big, no big girl mines. Um, and we did see some bats, but I'm not sure that we identified any with white nose syndrome. I do know that when we are specifically looking for it, the best way to test is to swab those bats, like with a little Q-tip to get a fungus sample. Um, and so we have teams that work on that, but it's not something that I have personally seen in the field yet. Okay, um, and a question from Donald. Can you describe a situation where there was initially resistance to a mitigation project and how you overcame that challenge? Oh, you put me on the spot, Donald. Now I have to rack my memory. Um, 
Sounds like an interview question. <laughs> it does sound like an interview question. I'm trying to think. So by mitigation project, I'm guessing you mean like an archaeological mitigation, like we need to take these extra steps above and beyond to protect this archaeological site. That's usually what I think of when someone talks about mitigation, like some developer is going to come in and put in a new freeway bypass and the archaeologists say, no, no, there's something important there. We have to mitigate the effects of your bypass by documenting the site or re excavating the site in detail to salvage what's left in there. Um, I, I, you know, off the top of my head, I really don't have any super specific ideas popping up. You know, sometimes they'll complain about the cost of it or say, why, why can't we just why is it important? Why do we need to preserve it? But, <laughs> but um, you know, I, I feel like it's something that we've mostly been able to come to an agreement on. That's a, that's a good one. I'm sure there are examples, but they're just not popping to the front of my head. Sorry. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, all right. Well, last question here um, from uh, Clarissa. Are there volunteer opportunities for people to assist in projects related to um, cultural resources in archaeology like this? Or is this kind of something that you got to have the letters behind your name, et cetera, et cetera? Actually, there are a lot of really great volunteer opportunities for folks interested in archaeology. You can, I would start by looking for museums or maybe park services or universities near you that host public archeology span events. Yeah, it really depends on where you live, but there are definitely opportunities. And that's how a lot of us got started is we sort of wanted to dip our feet in and try it out. And, and then we fell in love and couldn't, could never quit. Wow, well, that is awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much again uh, for educating us on the link and balance between conservation and archaeology. Um, thank you as well to the audience for joining us. Um, to learn more about BCI's work, you can visit our website at batcon.org. That's B-A-T-C-O-N dot O-R-G. And if you haven't already, subscribe to our mailing list and newsletter. That's where you'll hear about future webinars, bat chats, and the work that we do. So this webinar will be uploaded to our YouTube channel in a few business days. You can just search for it at Bat Conservation on YouTube. All right, any final words for us, Autumn? Support your local bat conservation efforts. Support your local friendly archeologists. Would love to nerd out on you anytime. Thanks everybody. Yeah, all right. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope you all love bats even more than you did an hour ago. And we'll see you at the next bat chat. Bye everyone.